then. So welcome to the third Insights 2021 seminar. Uh, so please, oh, we've still got people arriving. Super. Um, how to move insight into action for adult social care. I'm joined today, uh, really privileged to be joined today, by Professor John Coffey, Pete Jackson and the wonderful Terry Blatter. Um, and before we get into the detail, I'm just going to cover some housekeeping whilst people join us. Um, please say hi. You've already started to say hello in the chat box. That's just fantastic. Um, say who you are, where you are, what you do. Um, these sessions are being recorded, so you'll have seen that as you joined us, so that we can share them afterwards. Uh, the only challenge with that is I do ask that people stay on mute, um, um, because it does help with the, the videoing. Um, but please, throughout this session, if you, when you're hearing something, if you're thinking, oh gosh, I've got a question, write it in the chat box. Uh, we've got colleagues on the line who, who are on the call with us who are going to um, pick those up and bring them in at the end of the session. So if you're part of the Twitterati, uh, please do tweet away. Um, our hashtag is hashtag Insight 2021. If you have a look, you'll see all the sessions are on Twitter um, there. If you've got any technical issues, again, mention these in the chat box and um, hopefully my colleagues will be able to help you out. So how are we doing? Are we good, are we good for getting going now then? Right, I will carry on with my little, uh, what, I've, what I've got to share with you. Super. So the plan for the session. Um, Professor John Glasby is going to provide us with an overview of the new 15 million pounds UK centre that he leads for implementing evidence in adult social care. Um, Impact is funded by the Economic and Social Research Council and the Health Foundation. He will follow this with uh, reflections and questions from Pete and Terry. And Terry will also then, Terry has a uh, user experience and she will some stories uh, about her experience. Um, we invite questions, as I've already said, from the audience about the Impact Centre. Please add them to the chat and my colleague Rachel or uh, Deb or Janine, lots of colleagues on the line, uh, will bring them to our attention near the end. end. Before, I get to, before I hand over to John, I'm just going to introduce you to the panel. So um, John is with us today in his capacity as the director for the new Impact Centre, Improving Adult Care Together. Those of you like us who are big fans of John will know his is a official bio picture. He became a, a professor at a young age, uh, but he's also considered a bit of a superstar in his field. Um, he's a social worker by trade uh, and now his academic role sits in that space between theory and what happens in real life. In his spare time, apparently, He's also a professor of health and social care at the University of Birmingham. He's author of textbooks and research, a non-exec director at UHB, University Hospitals Birmingham, um, a fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences, a senior fellow of the NIHR school, um, and so on and so on. So, so lots, uh, lots of very busy um, individual there. Um, and then we've got Pete. Uh, Pete Jackson is an improvement um, is the Improvement Director for the um, West Midlands Association of the Directors of Adult and Social Care. He specialises in sector-led improvement, adult social care, community development, social media, sector engagement and diversity. We're also joined by Terry Blatter. Terry has over two decades of experience using direct payments to support the care of her mother who had dementia. Terry's been invited by John today to give her views as a layperson, having previously participated in research in a research project for uh, the University of Birmingham. Um, but first of all, before I go any further, I'm going to do a cheeky shout out to Terry's daughter, um, Zoe Carcienti. I do hope I got that right. Um, Zoe has recently completed her training to be a nurse and was one of those third year students who was given temporary registration so she could support COVID in her hospital. Welcome, Zoe. Thank you for joining us today and your colleagues for everything you did for us all over the last 18 months. So that's my bit done. Time for me to be quiet and hand over to John who for the next 20 minutes or so uh, will share how the Impact Centre came about and what is hoped to be achieved. That's great, Karen. Thank you ever so much. And I hope everyone can hear me OK. Um, thank you for that, that very kind introduction. I feel like I can only disappoint after such a, such a bigging up at the start. 
But thank you for um, joining us today. And I'll just share my slides uh, a, a moment and then uh, make a start. Hopefully people can see that okay. Maybe if Karen could nod, because I can see Karen, that's great, thank you. Yeah, so my name's John Glasby, and as well as working at the university, I'm also the director of Impact, new UK centre for implementing evidence in adult social care. As Karen said, it's funded by the Economic and Social Research Council and the Health Foundation. And our, our strapline and our belief is that the good support isn't just about services, it's about having a life. We've um, won as a result of a national tender uh, 15 million pounds over the next seven years to design and then deliver uh, this centre for implementing evidence. Uh, our leadership team is made up of uh, 13, uh, five universities, uh, it's Birmingham, Sheffield, Cardiff, Stirling and Ulster, uh, and then eight policy practice partners, which include organisations like Think Local Act Personal, Carers UK, the Care Workers Charity, ADAS, the Social Care Institute for Excellence, the British Association of Social Workers, Skills for Care, Scottish Care, uh, and so on. And we also um, have a broader consortium of another 20 or 30 partner organisations, some of whom are national membership bodies, like the, the National Care Forum, for example, others of whom are, are national voluntary organisations like HUK, and some are slightly broader partners like the Office for National Statistics, uh, for example. Uh, we're a UK centre, so trying to root ourselves in the, the very different policy and practice contexts of the four nations, as well as sharing lessons learned across the UK. And we're very definitely an implementation centre, not a research centre. The aim is to get evidence of what works, used in practice to make a difference to services, and then hence to people's lives. When I say evidence, we've got a very broad um, definition of what constitutes valid evidence. That may be really of interest to the audience today. Uh, when I talk about evidence of what works, I mean knowledge gained from different types of research, but I also mean the lived experience of people who draw on care and support and the lived experience of carers. And I mean the practice knowledge of social care staff uh, and we think that those three ways of knowing the world, evidence, uh, research evidence, lived experience and practice knowledge are all important in their own right. And we think that you need to bring them with you together to, to triangulate, but then also to work with as you bring people together from different parts of the social care system to work on common challenges and, and hopefully on common solutions. And we've see, received a very strong steer from across the sector that the, the models of delivery we, we develop um, have to be really embedded in the realities of local practice and the realities of people's lives, whilst also trying to find ways to take that learning uh, and to share it and to scale it and to get it embedded in national policy and practice. Uh, our, our aims are on the slide here. It's, uh, it's about more widespread use of evidence it's about building capacity in the workforce. It's about uh, more sustainable and more productive relationships between different stakeholders as we, we co-create change. And in the process, we also hope to understand more about the nature of implementation in adult social care, what helps and uh, what hinders. And we've been commissioned with three phases of development uh, from about June till um, end of October, effectively. We have a co-design phase where we're consulting with the sector in all its diversity and across all four nations as to how the centre should go about prioritising its work, what exactly it should do, and how that should fit alongside what already exists and what, what sometimes already works well in different parts of the UK. We then have a, an establishment phase um, for 12 years. So I've just got Karen raise her hand there. So. Yeah, sorry, John, I didn't want to interrupt you, but the, the sound quality is not great. So I'm not sure if you turned your uh, camera off, that that might just help with the with the, the bandwidth. Thank you. Sorry to have sure. interrupted your flow there. No, thank you very much. Uh, let me try again. Is that better, Karen? I think so. I think so. Yes. F fingers crossed. I'll keep going. And please, please say if it doesn't uh, work. So yes, we then have a, an establishment phase in 2022 when we're getting up and running, but we want that to be a really active uh, delivery orientated 
phase where alongside establishing the centre, we're also um, testing our proposed delivery models in practice so that we learn by doing uh, as we go along. And then we have a five year delivery period from 2023. Uh, with a longer term aspiration that either the centre or some of its models and, and functions become core features of the social care landscape going forwards. Just really briefly, during that co-design phase, we've been meeting with um, different stakeholders and organisations across the UK, um, about 100 um, so far. To, um, to have these discussions one-on-one, -on -one, either with individuals or with leadership teams. We've got an online survey, um, which takes about 10 minutes to fill out and is really helping to shape our work programme. That actually closes on Friday, so if people are still interested today, there is scope to complete that survey um, still. And we've had about uh, 2,000 responses so far from across the UK, uh, and, and a significant proportion of those people use services themselves or our carers or our frontline practitioners. We have uh, five impact assemblies, uh, one each in Wales, Northern Ireland and Scotland, and two in England. And each of those is made up of about 30 people, uh, people who use services, carers, practitioners, providers, commissioners, researchers and others, working together to help shape impacts work uh, and its plans. And then we have a lived experience engagement lead who is working with user and carer led organisations and with community organisations that work with people whose voices are seldom heard across the UK to, to promote impact uh, and the survey and our assemblies to those organisations, but also to involve them in shaping the, the principles and the structures that we have for co-production throughout the life of the centre. Uh, and there's more information on the centre and how to get involved and how to sign up um, via the uh, web address on the, uh, the slide. Really briefly, we're, we're likely to suggest four main um, delivery models. And um, I'll just describe these really briefly before handing over to Pete and to Terry. Um, but for uh, more strategic long-term um, issues, we're suggesting a series of demonstrator sites where a pair of coaches, perhaps somebody with experience of managing strategic change, and someone with experience of drawing on care and support work together to uh, to facilitate an evidence-informed change project at local level in the process they would also support that local system to carry out an evaluation of, of what's possible to achieve or not by working in this way and identifying some of the barriers and success factors so we'd be helping to build capacity by supporting others to evaluate rather than, than doing it for them those coaches as, as well, crucially, would work with national policy and practice partners to embed the lessons from that local work. So if a topic was, uh, let's say, how do you support people with learning disabilities and autism to come out of long stay hospital and lead more ordinary lives in the community? Uh, that might be really amenable to one of those impact demonstrators. And our coaches would be leading that work at local level, supporting a local evaluation. But then the product might be a change in the way that the CQC registers and inspects long stay hospitals, or perhaps a change in the social work curriculum. So we educate practitioners differently in future, or it could be a new service design that's pioneered by one of our third sector partners and then invested in by some of our commissioners. Or it could be a combination of those things so that we're uh, taking the work that we do in the realities of local practice but scaling it up by trying to embed it uh, in national policy and practice more generally. The second model uh, we've called impact networks, and the, these are really used uh, with a carers organisation in Sweden that we're working with, and um, they're for more short term intensive practical problem solving. And in a country like the UK, you might create 10 or 12 networks across the country, all working on the same issue in their local area. They'd be made up of users, carers, practitioners and managers who'd meet together for a six month period. They'd get some stimulus uh, material from us at the start to summarise the evidence and to, to, to start them off. And then there'd be quite a structured process of feeding back after each meeting in terms of what they've talked about, what they've done, what impact it's had, what barriers they've faced and how they've got around them and what the longer term outcomes have been. 
And all that material is summarised and then sent back out to all of the networks before the next meeting. So again, you have these very local action orientated groups doing stuff on the ground, uh, but with a scope, an interplay between the local and the national. From, uh, for issues where we're responding more to the immediate needs of the, the field, we have uh, what we're calling impact facilitators who would be brokers, if you like, placed in a, in a local organisation. So if a topic was uh, improving support for carers at end of life, we might uh, employ a facilitator to work in um, with the hospice movement, say, to be delivering that, that project on the ground. And then we do also have a, a service which we're calling Ask Impact, which um, is really the, the website and makes available all the materials in very accessible ways. But it's also, there's also scope for people to um, email in with key questions or challenges or dilemmas they're facing. Uh, and our team would collate those queries and where there are some common themes emerging would produce some evidence-based uh, guidance or, or source material uh, in response to those queries so that we could respond directly to queries from the field, but also learn from the different uh, types of query that we were receiving um, and use that to um, influence our future work uh, program. It's also been said actually as a byproduct that some of the service users and carers who are working with us find it really difficult to know what good looks like because a lot of the available evidence and other material isn't available to them in accessible forms. It might be before, behind a paywall or it may not be written in a way that's very accessible. So actually if that, those, that material could be available really, really accessibly, could it also as a byproduct help users and carers who want to challenge local services and hold them to account uh, by helping them to raise their awareness and understanding of what the evidence suggests is best practice uh, and what might help to improve local services. And then with all those models, we'd have a really strong emphasis on scaling and sharing, whether that's via learning networks, web resources, uh, professional guidance, links into further and higher education and so on. So in a moment, I will stop uh, sharing my screen and I'll put um, maybe the how to get involved section of the website in the chat so that people have it. But this effectively is the website. People can register their details there to get uh, further information. And then in particular, we have the survey that is about to, to, to end. So it's the last chance if people want to actively shape the way in which we prioritise uh, and spend that, that 15 million pounds. I hope the sound's improved a little bit and apologies for that. I will stop sharing my screen now, if that's okay, Karen. Uh, that's great. Uh, I'd love, just thank you, John. Um, I've also posted the link to the website in the chat box as well uh, to encourage people to go there and encourage people to complete the survey as well, um, just to, to add into that. Thank you, John. Um, just I found so many similarities to uh, the, um, some of our approaches in the strategy unit. As you know, we, we love, um, we're, we're an evidence based uh, unit um, and we host the Midlands Decision Support Network, whose objective is to um, to support help, health, health and care. So, um, yeah, very similar models and approaches. Really enjoyed seeing that um, your, your different approaches that you're taking there. Thank you, John. Um, at this point, I'm going to ask Pete um, to come in and um, and to share your reactions to the creation of impact uh, and what this means um, here in the West Midlands. So uh, thanks, Karen, and, uh, and, and, and thanks, uh, John, for, I think, uh, outlining something which from West Midlands ADAS's point of view is is really crucial and essential at the moment. Uh, just to, first of all, let me explain a bit about West Midlands ADAS. So we represent the 14 uh, directors of adult social services in the West Midlands, 14 councils, and obviously part of a national organisation, uh, which predominantly supports the, those directors in terms of their personal development, but acts as a sort of lobbying organisation as well on behalf of, of local government and the sector. In the West Midlands, uh, we've got a very active um, uh, branch, as we call it, and a very active programme of improvement. And probably about um, three years ago, maybe four, um, we talked about our story and about how social care presents itself. <clears throat> Often, and the, the news uh, yesterday, today, the following day, 
generally present social care as being in, in crisis, as suffering from uh, decades, or in particular the last decade of underinvestment from, from central government, a sense that uh, services are um, run on a shoestring, that the availability of services to some of the most um, valuable people in our communities are, are lacking, and that the really it's still run on a fairly old-fashioned basis. Four years ago, we decided that we were going to try and flip uh, that argument and say that rather than social care being seen as a, a deficit uh, model, local councils will predominantly say 50% of their spending goes on adult social care. Other parts of the council will say flipping social care again, spending all of our money, flipping social care, bringing all of these uh, negative um, news stories to our attention. And that sort of flipping thing was, our, was, was a sort of a way of us saying, well, let's look at it in a different way. Let's look at the 175,000 people that were employed in social care in the West Midlands, more, uh, more than you get at the com combined attendances at Aston Villa, Birmingham, Coventry, Walsall and, uh, and West Brom on a, on a Saturday afternoon, a, 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 a massively significant sector of employment. Let's talk about the um, 1,300 uh, care facilities that there are within the region. I always look at outside my window and I live in Telford and we see lots of house building. Um, we see very little uh, industry, new industry being built, but what we do see is care homes, facilities for people with learning disabilities, mental health, actually sprouting up all over the place actually. And one of the biggest uh, investments in, in our local economy actually is through the building of care facilities. So. We wanted to change that round and in particular as well to think about the people who, who use services, who actually uh, Terry's on the call, call today about how do we get better at using their insights into influencing the way that services are delivered. So I want to just make that point first of all. We want to try and think about this in a, as a sort of an asset based approach to social care and what John's describing. I think for the first time, certainly in England, uh, in my memory, uh, a major investment in thinking about the future for social care. We we joke to ourselves often that um, a, a sort of a, a day, an hour is a long time in social care at the moment. People are under incredible pressure. COVID has intensified those things for people to actually be responding to things that are right in front of them and trying to make, make do. Very little investment in forward planning, very, very little investment in thinking, about one, two, five, 10, 15 years. And when we do look at 10, 15 years ahead and we look about the impact of an aging population, people with living longer lives, more complex needs, we think this, the investment in the future is really essential. So John and, his, and the insight uh, the, and, and the impact project, I think are a real feather in the cap, not only for the West Midlands, for social care, but for the country. And we'd like to, through West Midlands ADAS, continue to work with John and others are on this call. It's great as well, uh, Karen, to see such a variety of people on the call. I recognise some names, I recognise, but there's lots of people that I don't. Um, I think what we're trying to do with it within ADAS is think about insight, which is the theme of the, of the conversation, in, in sort of three ways. One is around uh, our immediate insight is driven by governments. And it's the insight, for example, into knowing how many care workers are going to be vaccinated to be able to be continuing running services beyond the 11th of November. So we have a daily, a daily chase of actually being asked, you know, how many people have had the vaccine? How many people are going to be leaving the sector? On the, so that's an immediate assurance question. The second one is how do we use our data for improvement? How do we measure who's doing well and who's doing not so well? And actually, we've developed within the re region a, a sort of a, a knowledge hub that we're using increasingly actively to sort of draw out from the massive amount of data which is available for social care. We sometimes describe it as sort of infobesity. We're, we're drowning it. It's very unhealthy, the amount of information that we've, we've got that we find really difficult to do anything with. So increasingly thinking about how we using that data for insight to actually help us improve our services. And then finally, why I think this is really exciting is like, 
you're also using that data for innovation. And I think this is where John's work and the work of uh, Peter Spilsbury and the Decision Support Unit comes in, because it's all about us starting to get better in social care at modelling, about thinking about what impact investment in one area will have on another, unintended consequences or what actually works. And social care hasn't got a strong evidence base, I would argue, partly because we're always very defensive about our data. We always say it's out of date. We always say it's measuring the wrong things. We always say it's set from a, a central uh, government point of view and therefore doesn't measure the impact that we're having on our, our communities and our localities. But increasingly thinking about unstructured data, thinking about the case files that uh, social workers collect, thinking about the sort of regular surveys that we do within the sector. We think we've got to get better at presenting that sort of information to influence and inform the sector going forward. We also think, uh, and this is um, recognising the, the work that people like Terry do, actually. It's also, you know, are you get, gathering soft intelligence, we call it anecdotes. We also call it increasingly, how do we quantify our intuition? What are the things that our gut feelings of the people who've worked in the sector, who've experienced the sector, know from just witnessing what's going on? And we want to get better as a sector at presenting that information as credible and, an, and a force for good. And I think finally, what I, what I want to say is that and we're really pleased. Um, there's some people on, on the call I know today from the National, National Institute for Health Research. And we have been working closely with them this, this, this last six months thinking about how do we prepare social care, not only for um, building a, a research culture, which we think is really important for uh, the region and for, for the country for social care, but also how do we use that for our improvement and our innovation? Because we think those three things are all part of the same, peas in the same pod. And actually improvement to us is something which we will be measured on. The government will be quantifying who's doing better than others. And we want to use that uh, challenge, if you like, to say, actually, we do need to be better at presenting evidence. So, so the work that John's doing, we, we are completely behind and see that as a real flagship for how we can all get better at, uh, at research. But importantly for us, how we all get better at improvement in innovation. And that's, I think, the, the key messages from, from me from, from the session today, Karen. Thank you. Thank you, Pete. Um, um, just to say that um, in, infobesity has got the big thumbs up. People like that as a word. Um, I, I, I'm, I might see that on Twitter later on, I'm thinking. Um, and I'm struck. I'm an NHS person um, and uh, I'm struck with similarities with the NHS, of what you just described there. We're working in th this together, aren't we? And uh, really encouraged by that research culture. Um, and um, and some, yes, sorry, my sound isn't great. I'm not quite sure how to resolve some of that, but um, my apologies for that. Hopefully um, it's not going to interfere with the next section. Um, and I'm going to welcome Terry to the screen. Hi, Terry. Thank you. Thank you. Let me know, Karen, if you'd rather me turn the video off. Uh, um, I might. I think I might be the one how, who needs to turn um, the or, video off. <laughs> or from a technical issue. Okay, okay no worries. So, so everybody, um, please, I, I'd like to introduce you to the wonderful Terry. Uh, Terry and I have got to know each other over the last week in prepping for this session and uh, and I feel like I've got a new best friend um, and uh, we've just we've really enjoyed it haven't we Terry but um, and what we've been doing is we've been talking about her experience as a carer and a user of direct payments so Terry um, I just like to invite you to um, share with people you some of your experiences both the good and the bad um, because you were a trailblazer, weren't you, uh, back in the day um, around using direct payments because you had two decades of caring for your mum with dementia. Um, and so um, I want to hand over to you now just to tell us about that. Thank you, Karen. And I think I'm really going to miss you and you'll have to call me tomorrow. Otherwise, I'm going to have withdrawal symptoms. We've had such fun and laughing and you've been such a support after my 
real anxieties. And before I start, I just have to say that um, now, because of you, your fault, everybody knows that I'm the mother of Zoe. She will be so relieved that I'm dressed because when I spoke to her earlier, she said, you're not going to look like that, are you? With your father coming out of the bedroom with his dressing gown on, looking like a real carer, but also okay. Before I start about my direct payments, am I allowed to ask John a question? Yeah. Yes, so, you can. I've sort of almost answered it myself in a way because I, on reading what he, the wonderful work that uh, he's going to be doing, and also I do want to say that I really enjoyed listening to Pete just now, but I wanted to know why um, evidence from research has not been used previously. Why, why has this happened? Where does it all go to? Uh, and I almost answered my own question because skimming through the rest of the um, presentations, not during the speaking, this was last night, I saw that the very next presentation that's going on is actually about this question I've been asking, or that I want to ask John about why evidence isn't used, because it's apparently shown that it takes 17 years for the imp implementation of evidence to be put into practice. That blew me away. That Right. That's the question I wanted to ask him. Um, but to go on and uh, not to take up too much time about direct payments. We, can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you loud and clear. Right. Uh, on my video okay? You're beautiful. <laughs> right, okay. Um, direct payments. My mantra was always best thing since sliced bread. It was fantastic. All I wanted to care for my mother was hands-on help. I didn't want people talking to me. I didn't want leaflets thrown at me. I just wanted hands-on help. Direct payments gave me that. It gave me autonomy. It gave me the ability to do things the way that I felt was best for my mother. I'd had the experience of uh, my maternal grandmother having Alzheimer's disease. And they were very difficult times way back in the 1960s, uh, 70s, things were very different then. And it's too hard for me to reflect on those times. Therefore, for my mother, I wanted things different. I always said that I would look after her. And speaking of my mother, actually, it doesn't sound like this. When I speak of my grandmother, I'm, I'm uh, emotionally charged, but not with my mother. I don't feel that emotional drain that I had when I think of and reflect on my grandmother and how I care I was for her. My mother was a lady and she remained a lady to her death. And this was enabled by direct payments, by having the best of care. Um, I was able to buy my own care. It was a huge learning curve. I think we've discussed this, Karen, uh, over this um, support network you've sent me. And perfection didn't happen overnight. This isn't the forum, I think, although you might have wanted me to say about all the ups and downs, but I think this isn't the place for that. This is for another time. Call me back to speak about it, but not for now. Um, it's enough to say that for 10 years, I had the best care ever. And I'm proud to say that not me running, but because of my carers, I had a model of excellence. But my experience will not suit one and all. I want to say also, I must, I must put in here something about Birmingham uh, training, learning and development. They, from Birmingham City Council, they were a huge support. And actually I'm still being supported by them now because my husband has root body dementia and um, they, they're still in contact with me and I'm well, well supported, which is fantastic. I need to say that, um, sorry about this, but professionals um, need to speak to those with lived experience 
um, to that end, I have to thank John for allowing me a platform here on, and allowing me to give a voice during his present with his presentation. And thank I thank John for that. Professionals need to tick boxes. The need needs are people who uh, are using the services go by need, different to where professionals are coming from. So the professionals need to hear that voice. Policies are put in place, but they don't always fit the bill. There was once, uh, we, you know, we do go through social workers and um, we had um, a wonderful, wonderful so social worker that used that um, part in John's talk about practice wisdom. He practiced his wisdom. He was brilliant. I was taking a risk with what I was doing, according to the professionals. He was able, with his wisdom, to look outside that box. He acknowledged the risk. He said, his words were, you're taking an educated risk, but it's more important. Well, he didn't say it. I, he was saying it was an educated risk and it was fine to do it because it was better than not doing it. And that was more important than a policy that had been written in some back office. But life uh, is about a fine balance. It's not always easy to get it right. And we do have to take care. There are safeguarding issues and everything, and that has to be looked at. And I can appreciate that. So really, I think what professionals need to do is see with whom they're dealing, look at what they're seeing and, and, and look sometimes outside that box and away from the policies. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing what evolves from uh, John's impact. I think it's wonderful that this is happening. And just to close, um, I think we need a knowledge base to understand these services. Information needs to be disseminated. Finding it is so difficult. The social worker at the start of my direct payments journey didn't have a, at that time, sorry, this was years ago now, did not have a clue about direct payments, never heard of it. It was the expertise of my brother who was um, into policy writing for mental health, who thank goodness found this um, wonderful uh, facility for me and involved pen drills and we got it all set up. So um, professionals don't know everything, they don't know it all. I had professional friends in, in medicine and uh, all such services who actually had to come to me because they didn't know where to go for the help, but yet they were already in their working life involved in this sort of things. My carers thought of ways of doing things. My background was in nursing, but I stood in awe of the ex expertise of the girls who helped me just using their common sense. It's not all about, you know, um, education and academia. It's about knowing what to do and how to do it. And I think John may forgive me for mentioning one of his wonderful talks, uh, which I heard many years ago, when he said he was in a crisis, he was at a loss and didn't know where to go. And his punchline was, he had written the book, getting out the help, he'd written the book about it. But when he was in that mode, in that crisis, it was, it, it didn't know at that point where to turn. I, 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 I he made it, he normalized everything. I thought that was very good. Um, so I think that um, using people with lived experience is certainly a credible way of working. And thank you.
that's it. Oh, thank you very much, Terry. Um, really appreciate that. Appreciate that you you didn't want to go to the bad stuff, uh, the sad stuff. So thank you very much for sharing. And and I think you you demonstrated the value of the work that John and the team are are are, are going towards. Because one of the great things that you shared with me was the fact that you had carers who were able to go outside of the policy rules to do what was best for your mum and for you um, in that situation. Uh, and and that was the, the the thing that was so great about them. Um, and then that social worker as well, who was so critical in that process. So um, I'd just like John and Pete to come back into the conversation now. We've got about 15 minutes, uh, maybe 10 minutes before we end. And I just and I just wondered um, how will impact use, you know, we've got a great example there with Terry about using that lived experience for both good and the bad of the service. So, yeah, could you just uh, a bit um, about how that how that's going to work in in real life, and then and then with Pete, how are you going to take that and and change things at the at grassroots? Yeah, thank you. I mean, thanks to Terry um, and to, to Pete, that was really moving. And um, thank you for all the kind things you said about about me as our as our kind of lives have crossed over the over the years. Um, Yes, we're, we're trying to build lived experience into to everything uh, we do, um, into um, the staff team that we appoint, into the panels that, that, that appoint our staff, into the way we devise and prioritise our work programme, uh, and into the delivery models that we, that we use. And then we have people with lived experience and carers on our leadership team, um, and indeed on the uh, a co-production advisory group that will be supporting us in particular uh, around our, our approach to co-production uh, and then we've also uh, worked with our funders to make sure that they try to build lived experience into the advisory group and the management board that they report uh, to so that we have lived experience be built in at, at every level. Um, I think a key contribution that the centre will make actually is in its definition of evidence uh, the, the notion of evidence as constituting different types of research, lived experience and practice knowledge, and then working with that in reality when we're trying to summarise the evidence and um, support its use in practice. Um, having a debate about the nature of evidence sounds like a kind of philosophical debate, but, but for me it's a really practical, really important issue which asks whose voices do we value when we're having these discussions? Who gets heard and who doesn't? And um, how do we work together, given the different backgrounds that we have and the different parts of the system that we come from, to do some stuff together and to make a difference and to, to learn by doing as we go along? So, so the definition of evidence, although it sounds odd, it, you know, actually is, it really drives some tangible, practical, values-based stuff which is probably quite different to how some other sectors approach uh, these kinds of things organizations like nice for example have perhaps traditionally started in a slightly different place although actually they're having loads of really creative conversations about these these issues too and thinking about um uh, about these kind of matters uh, as well um and i think it also comes down to um some of what pete was saying about celebrating the um, the nature of social care. If you, if you see social care as just being about services that we fund, and if you see it as a kind of a bare minimum that governments have to provide to, to meet public expectations, it can seem like a, a drain on our collective resources. Uh, but actually, we think social care is a form of social and economic investment. It's about kind of creating the, the sorts of lives that we want to have together as a community and as a society. Um, and it's about having a life. It's not just about services. Uh, so reframing social care in, in, in that kind of way, I think, shifts the nature of the debate in the way that Pete was, was mentioning. Um, and that then it becomes much more about relationships. And, and that's about trust and reciprocity and how we, uh, you know, we may not agree, but, but we can have honest and open conversations with each other about where we're coming from and about where next. Um, so I think all those are part of that, that that kind of response, Karen, if that's helpful. I don't know what Pete would say if, if that was similar. I, I, I think your um, broadening of the term evidence, actually, John, I think is really welcome. Um, 
And I think the broadening of the term research by our colleagues at uh, the, the um, NIHR is really helpful as well of thinking about research not just being about research for research sake but research for improvement research for improve for innovation and I think what strikes me about the nature of the people on the call and looking at some of the comments in the chat is that we we all are accused of, of living in our own little silos aren't we that we're all accused of we've all got our own niche contributions to make what this I think um uh broadcast starts to emphasize for the West Midlands, I think in particular, is that some of those silos are starting to be broken down and some people are climbing over into other people's silos and starting to say, well, have you thought about it from their point of view? Have you, have you thought about it from Terry's point of view? And I think that's all about us getting better at bringing together all of our collective resources, experience, knowledge, um, understanding, insight into what the future looks like and I think you know this is a I think this is fantastic to start to think about well at the start of a journey with John, John with impact but actually there's a lot of things happening behind that as well that are all about us getting better at sharing our acronyms at sharing our frustrations at sharing our resources to think about how do we get how do we do this differently and I think uh, you know I just think that is really exciting and something that's uh, great to be part of. Thank you both. I know which society I want to be part of um, from what you're describing there. So um, can I invite some questions from the audience? I don't know if Rachel or Janine have been able to keep an eye on the chat um, and whether they, they can share some of the questions. The last one that's just appeared is a brilliant question. It's from Laura Johnson and Laura is asking us how we balance the voices of people with lived experience with insight that's gathered from a larger and more representative set of voices. So I'd actually disagree with Laura on this. Laura is saying that sometimes she finds people put more emphasis on hearing the voices of people with lived experience and less so on the insight that's been gathered in a more robust way so I think by that she's saying a more qualified or a more quantitative way I would say we're actually the other way around in health and social care we put a lot more evidence on things that we can count than the stories that we hear but I think that's a really interesting perspective to pick up and talk about um Shall I, shall I just say a couple of words there, if that's helpful? So, yeah. so our survey has been about, about 2,000 people so far, and, and, and the people taking part have said that they think, um, typically when we think about evidence, it, it's research that dominates practice knowledge and lived experience, and that it's often particular forms of research, um, either, uh, either economic or more uh, clinical uh, uh, research in, in a health and care setting randomized controlled trials and systematic reviews and that some of those are fantastic for answering particular kinds of question but that it depends what you want to know as to how you go about um, answering the the question um, so i don't think there's a hierarchy of, of evidence out there you just have different approaches that are better for, for different kinds of of question um, I know exactly what the question's about. I, I get slightly nervous about the use of the word representative, not, not in context, but, but often when I'm in face-to-face uh, -face settings uh, with, a, with a diverse audience, um, it can sometimes feel as if the person that is drawing on lived experience is, is being asked to not just talk about their own experience, but also to somehow represent other people with lived experience in a way that doesn't apply to other panel members. So I never get asked to represent social scientists or, or academics. I just get invited to stuff because people seem to think that I've got a perspective that, that's helpful. It doesn't make me any more right than the next person. But, but as part of hearing a range of voices, I get invited to, to stuff and I don't get asked to represent anybody. So there's a danger of a two tier system where we ask people with lived experience to be representative when we don't ask the rest of us. Um, but when it comes to amassing and, and reviewing an evidence base. Uh, some of the materials that the Social Care Institute for Excellence um, produce actually are really good in that respect. And they've got some guidance about how you might go about 
reviewing the evidence to, to, to make sure that you're including different types of, of, of material. Uh, but I think it's mainly about a process of triangulation. Um, if I was trying to improve a service and I spoke to one person who gave me their personal experience, it may not be a very good basis on which to reform an entire service. Equally, I wouldn't read just one article by one academic with one particular worldview. Uh, I'd, I'd cast the net, net wide as I was trying to amass the material that there was out there. And then I would bring it together to try and um, work through the key themes uh, and the key things that that evidence base, that very diverse evidence base was, was telling me. And I suspect it's a similar kind of process um, here. Uh, where this is at its most dangerous, though, just to finish, is, is, uh, is where lived experience isn't even taken into account mm. because it's not seen as a valid form of evidence. So I did a review for the government on what works in adult mental health. And uh, one of the chapters was around um, inpatient services. And we'd said from all the evidence that we reviewed, um, some of it written by practitioners in mental health settings and some of it written by people with experience of being uh, inpatients, there were some real problems around the quality of care and the culture in some inpatient services. And some people feel they get better in spite of mental health hospitals rather than because of them. Um, the government was fine with the report and then we sent it off to a psychiatric journal and the reviewer who was the psychiatrist um, sent his comments back and said, um, none of this is based on a randomised controlled trial. And if it's not in a randomised controlled trial, I refuse to believe it's true. Mm. Which at least was a very honest statement of how they see the world. But, but what a kind of blinkered and limited way of seeing the world. If we won't do anything about an issue and, until there's a randomised controlled trial, then, then we might never do anything about loads of things. So, so I think the question is right to say you've got to bring different types of material together. You've got to weigh it up. You've got to triangulate it. You've got to be critical and inquisitive about it. But actually, the bigger danger for me is that is that lived experience never really gets on the agenda because it gets mm -hmm. edited off um, and edited out before we even have the conversation. I, I, can I follow on there, uh, Karen? Just say I think you know, one of the key uh, values and, and priorities, really, from from West Midlands ADAS is around the term social justice. Actually, in terms of recognising that uh, some of our um, I say valuable people in our communities, people who are the most voiceless, who, who are least heard. We all think really strongly that their voices should be heard. And therefore, therefore, we often say, actually, we've got to include people in part of our panels or in part of our groups. But I think in some ways, and I'd be interested to wider view on this, and I mentioned it in my, in my introduction earlier, it's about, talk about um, quantifying our intuition. So sort of using, I suppose, digitally and, 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 and using, uh, data these days. There's a there's ways of us sort of s promoting the v voices and views of people in a, in a in a stronger way or in a in a more what appears to be a more scientific way. And I think when I heard the minister for social care yesterday say that nothing's going to get through her unless there's an evidence base to, de to determine it, my first reaction was to think, well, actually, that rules most things out because the evidence or the data will be inevitably what they look to first. That's the trend at the moment, isn't it? And, you know, we all understand that. But actually, there's something about us as a sector being more assertive about knowing what those, uh, that intuition, that gut feeling, that evidence that's created by people's lived experience and worked experience over many years. So I think we need to be stronger on that. And I think that the other, the other term that I mentioned about unstructured data, was also around not just relying on spreadsheets and, uh, ex, you know, sort of data crunching. That infobesity is a serious point, really, that we've got so much information in front of us, we can't see the wood for the trees and finding ways of actually using other types of information. John's, you know, the term triangulation is, is obviously the right way, is the right way to do is it. All of those different points of the triangle need to be given equal value uh, and weighted differently in terms of the audience, I would suspect. But they, they, we've got to bring that together in a way which is far stronger than we currently, than, than we currently do. Can I'm, I... Yes, I'm, please, Janine. Sorry, can I... And I, I think everybody loved the term infobesity and I think it um, sums up how a lot of us feel about the volume of information that's out there we're talking about more and more information more and more evidence what do we do to make 
all of this easy and we've got the session this after later on this afternoon that is about actually how do you turn this into practice but that's my question back to you how do we make it easy for people that are working in the field that are really really busy to be able to decide which pieces of the evidence are the right pieces of evidence for them to be basing their decisions and basing their changes in practice on and how do they kind of navigate it through so that they're actually using it most appropriately and most effectively that sounds like a really big question Janine and I'm, I'm really aware that we've only got two minutes to go so so I, I um, uh, and, and that people may may need to leave us in a mo um, so I'm happy to invite um, Peter John to respond to that um, but just recognize um, others may need to leave us now and to say thank you very much for joining us well I'm happy to pick up the conversation offline there, uh, Karen. You know, that's, 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 that sounds like a great question. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And happy for you to carry on now if you've got the time to. I just wanted to give other people the chance to say goodbye and thank you very much for yeah. those that need to go. Yeah, I might, I might need to leave at half past, uh, Karen, but um, I mean, just really briefly, I feel that's where something like impact can help. I mean, our, our view is you've got policy which tells you what we ought to be doing. We've got evidence that 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 tries to help us with you know what might work um but but the bit that's always felt missing to me and and it's why some of the improvement work that peter's doing is so important is is how do you actually do it and how do you actually do it in practice and how do you actually do it in practice in i don't know in the wrong part of birmingham on a friday afternoon when it's raining you know that level of detail and and part of what we've lost during austerity is a lot of the support that we had um that's happened a bit in the nhs but it's happened loads in adult social care um so, so we know what we ought to be doing we know sometimes we know what we think might work um but actually where do you get the support from to actually do it in in practice and some of our delivery models are really hands-on they're embedded in local practice they're about learning by doing and reflecting they're about doing together uh, one of our stakeholders described it as rolling your sleeves up and getting your hands dirty, not just talking about it. Uh, that that's what we want to do uh, with the funding, and that's and in the process we want to learn more about what helps and what hinders and what works in that kind of space. So there's a legacy that that better answers the, the, the question in the in in the longer term if our funding or if our centre isn't around anymore in the you know after our seven years. Um, so that's what impact's all about, really. Um, how do you actually do it in practice? And um, let's do do it together, and let's learn by uh, doing and reflecting as we go. I think that's a really great point at that point for us all to say thank you to John, to Pete, and to Terry for a really great session. And I don't know if you know how to use the old um, clap, but let's just show them a little bit of our love uh, and thank you very much. So, um, and um, we just have the screen up there showing what's coming up next. And uh, this will be going live on the the, um, the website in the next day or two for, for people who want to watch it back. Thank you very much, everybody.